Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, good to see so many of you here, uh, some familiar faces. Um, okay, uh, so Anna Lena is going to be doing the uh, all the uh, magic of controlling the screen. Uh, so the idea of the workshop is to find out what what we know and what we not know about research software engineering. Um, so we wanted to basically uh, find out what are the the, the uh, dark uh, dark matter areas on, on research software engineering. What are the topics that we don't know, and where more research would be required. And of course, the aim of this uh, workshop of these two workshops is to uh, collect some of the questions that we as a community have on research over engineering and write a paper about this in the end. So that's the, the end outcome of the workshop. Uh, so we wanted to start with a little icebreaker. Uh, so for this, Annalena has prepared a Mentimeter. Uh, OK, yes. Uh, so uh, I would ask you all if you want to uh, open your favorite browser and visit menti.com and you can enter the code at the top of the screen 23 32 18 2 and maybe you can tell us where you joining us from from today it's interesting to see uh, how much of a geographical distribution we get uh, okay. hamburg london Amsterdam, Edinburgh, the office. Oh, wow. People are still allowed to go to the office. Uh, more London, Utrecht. Yay for Utrecht. Uh, Durham in the UK. Okay, so I think uh, we have nine responses in the Mentimeter. Uh, what's um, Germany. Okay, do we want to... Um, Move to the next one, maybe. Okay. Uh, and the, this is an interesting question as well. Uh, so, what's the job title in your email signature? Community engagement officer, research software engineer, assistant professor. And director and senior research fellow, full stack developer, researcher. Ah, Re somebody with two jobs research over engineer and no signature, but would be a research over engineer, software engineer. In science research engineer. I'm just guessing who that would be, Robin. Okay, uh, so next one. Uh, why are you here today and what would you like to get out of this workshop? Better understanding of the RSC landscape, facts, figures, knowledge gaps. Great. I think that's one of the things that we would like to uh, 
to get out of this workshop. So uh, as a board member of NATL, RSC Association, I'm stumbling over so many things that we don't know and want to know, I want to change that. Yes, I think that's, that's very much in line with the, what we all would like to uh, have more clarity. Interesting perspective on RSC and its future. Get to know the RSC community and the future. More about the RSC community. Our own community, neuroscience, open science code efforts have potential overlap with other communities in particular source. Oh, it's interesting. There are other people think about similar questions later. Mm. Learn what areas people think RSC should cover. Nice. So that that those. So thank you for your uh, for your answers. That's. Um, that's actually very much in line with what we want to uh, get out of this workshop. We want to, uh, well, as you probably know, RSC is it's a, a relatively new term. Um, I mean, it's been around for maybe 10 years or so. Um, so it, it's a field that is still developing. Um, and I think we all have uh, some insight, uh, but mainly it's from personal experience or uh, from stories that we hear. So it's mostly empirical data that we have. Uh, and we think that it would be really good to have uh, more uh, evidence, uh, more uh, hard numbers, more hard data, and move beyond merely anecdotal e evidence. Uh, and of course, this is very necessary when we're trying talking to uh, policymakers, to funding agencies, uh, to have hard numbers to say, okay, we need to have more training because we have these numbers that show that 90% of RSEs learn on the job. Um, so I think in order to find out what we actually need to know, it's good to know what we already know uh, and what are the questions that we still want to answer. So what, what research do we need to do on the topic of RSE? Uh, so I think that those are the, the objectives of the workshop. Uh, so our aim is to collect questions uh, and know why we want to know to ask these questions. So if we want to know how many RSEs there are in the world, why is this interesting? Why is this important? Uh, well, because we want to organize a conference where everybody has a chair and we need to know how many people are coming to the party or things like that to really understand what are the, what's the motivation be between, behind the questions that we're asking. Um, so we really want to identify these open questions uh, and try to uh, yeah, motivate research to find the answers to these questions. Uh, so in the coming weeks, uh, our aim is to start working towards a paper um, and to, yeah, so, so that, that's some work that uh, the organizer, so uh, Annalena, Michelle and myself will do behind the scenes and we'll be uh, contacting uh, everybody who's interested but in potentially co-authoring the, the paper with us to uh, give your input, uh, have your uh, say and maybe provide us with some further information that you um, may have during the workshop and maybe after the workshop. Uh, okay, so um, the program for the work, uh, the workshop. So we, we have three small talks that uh, we ask people to, um, to give us their opinion of uh, what we already know of their country, uh, what um, questions they, they already have, what answers they already have a little bit to set the tone of the workshop. Uh, so we'll, uh, Annalena and I will play the videos uh, now. Um, and then after that, we'll start with the 
a world cafe in which we want to collect first the research questions to find out what questions uh, we already have uh, and then we'll after the break we'll discuss the questions in breakout groups so we'll split up in uh, breakout groups uh, to try to see which questions are more pressing are more uh, important uh, to find answers to uh, and then we'll rotate in the groups so everybody gets to see all the questions from all the breakout groups uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time to, at the end of the workshop to try to uh, define the process how are we going to be uh, working towards this paper um, so yeah that that's the program for today so now uh, we have three talks, one from uh, Simon Hedrick, uh, from Daniel Katz, and from Sera Rono from the Carpentries. Uh, so. Hi, I'm Simon Hedrick from the Software Sustainability Institute. I was asked to talk uh, for a source about something to do with RSEs and data, which is a, a nice wide open remit. I tried to narrow that down a bit by going onto Twitter and asking people what they were interested in. And the thing that came back very strongly was just how many RSEs exist in the world. So that's what I'm gonna look at in this talk. And at the end, I will come to a conclusion. The problem with this kind of study is that the majority of people who are doing research software engineering aren't called research software engineers. Now that's not a problem in itself. We don't expect people to adopt the title, but it does make counting people very difficult. So I thought I would start by looking at people we know are research software engineers, and those are the RSEs who work within RSE groups. I'm just doing this within the UK. RSE groups um, have been very successful in the UK. We started with the first one in UCL in 2013, and we've now got groups at 29 different universities. The most recent, just, just coming into the fold, is the University of Exeter, so welcome to them. Uh, at the start of this year, I talked to 25 of the RSE group leaders and collected some stats for the four groups that I couldn't get data on, I've just extrapolated. And I've come to the conclusion that in the UK RSE group, groups, there are 324 RSEs. So there are definitely more than this in the, in the world. This is our new base level. Now, the next strategy was to look at the UK RSE Association. Now, it was around for five years, whereas the society has only just taken over and been around for a year. So I thought this would be the better one to, to focus on. The problem with the association was that the membership um, didn't collect data on location. So all I've got to go on here is, is email addresses. So I cut out all the national email addresses apart from .uk's and .scots, and then with the .coms and .orgs that could be from anywhere, uh, I've, taken, I've dropped half of them, and I thought that was a reasonably conservative approach. Add all those memberships together, and we end up with basically a thousand members of the UK RSC Association in the UK. And I reckon that this is our new base level. There are definitely more than a thousand RSCs in the world. Now, next option literally guessing. There's a lot of experience out there. Lots of people working in this field uh, have a gut feel about how the ratio of researchers to Can we just check if you see anything on the video or not? There was getting some messages, but I didn't hear exactly what the problem was. I think the problem was that um, the Zoom windows were blocking um, the actual video. So they uh, okay. appeared as gray boxes on top of the video. But I, if I just don't do anything with Zoom, so it wasn't all the time? No, it wasn't all say? the time. It OK, that was me because I was checking some chat messages. And then. And it was. So I just like start playing again. The research software engineers. I asked on Twitter, and um, the responses clustered around these three different percentages. I tried to narrow that down by running a poll, and the poll split by 33% for each option. So there's not a huge amount of clarity on how many RSEs are out there. So I've just kept these three options, got the data on the number of researchers or the number of people employed in academia on research and research like contracts. Um, in the UK, that's 220,000. Use these percentages to narrow it down to there being somewhere between 2,200 and 72,000 RSEs in the UK. 72,000 seems too high. Right, final approach. Uh, since 2014, I've been scraping jobs from jobs.ac.uk. That's the de facto website for um, UK academia. Um, we've chained a machine learning algorithm 
to identify which jobs uh, cover work that the, that the majority of which is software development. So these are RSE-like jobs and RSE jobs. When we look at the figures for this, we find that uh, the, the mean percentage is 13% of all jobs uh, are RSE-like. So I'm going to make the, uh, the leap that that scales across all of UK academia. We know the number of academics because we, we, we looked at that in the previous slide. 13% of all UK, all UK academics gives us 28,000 uh, RSEs in the UK. But as I said, this kind of covers RSE-like jobs as well. So we've got this spectrum of research software engineering, and some of these people will be nearer the research end rather than the software engineering end. So let's be conservative again, and we'll drop half of them. And we'll say, in the UK, there are 14,000 RSEs. Oh, and I feel good about that number. It feels like the right number to me. Right, so now... We need to extrapolate this over the world. And this is where things get a little bit difficult because the data gets sparse. Uh, I'm turned to OECD that collects lots of really useful data on lots of different metrics. Problem is they don't always have all of the data you need for all of the countries. So I've taken two approaches. The first takes the R&D spending in a country and divides it by the average salary of that country. And I'm going to say that that um, is proportional to the number of RSEs. The second just looks at the number of researchers. Now, these aren't just researchers in, in academia. They're also outside of academia. Um, but I'm going to say that that, again, is proportional to the number of RSEs. Calculate a fraction and then scale it out for the number of RSEs we know in the UK. And we get these results. So you can see by spending, it feels wrong. Uh, for China, 500,000 RSEs would be one in six, I think, of their, of their total um, academic workforce. And the numbers seem a little high for the US as well. Um, however, when we look at just scaling by the number of researchers in that country, the numbers seem a lot more sensible. They increase as the population increases, and they increase also as the investment into R&D increases as well. And so this is this is the approach I'm going to, going to choose. If I was forced to do this, use this back of the envelope calculation to tell somebody how many RSEs are in the world, I would choose to scale it by the number of researchers. And that means that we can now add that column up and I can come to a conclusion. If you want to know how many RSEs are in the world, there are about 330,000. Thank you. My uh, slides and my analysis are available there. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Simon. And the next one up is Daniel Katz. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Katz from the University of Illinois. I want to talk about forming and supporting RSE groups and communities as part of this source session. I want to talk about three different life cycles that exist for RSEs in an organization. <clears throat> First is the uh, model where somebody in the organization hears about RSEs and they realize that they are one. They talk about this with their colleagues and they start creating an informal community they start to formalize the community through a mailing list, a Slack channel, lunches, other meetings, things like that. Um, eventually the community and its members join the international RSE community and they join their national association or society and any local groups that may be there. They share experiences and they learn from each other. And eventually they talk about their work with their human resources department and they create proper official roles and everyone lives and, and works happily ever after. Okay, so that's the first model. Second model, um, some software developers that are talking to each other, grouped together over time, because they need to more effectively managing the changing projects and staffing needs that they have, and to provide some semblance of a career path in a soft funded environment. One of them hears about RSEs and they realize that that's what they are and then they start talking to each other. They talk about this with other colleagues as well and this again leads to an informal community like in version one. They formalize the group if they can, if there's enough of them in a particular unit, in a department or in an IT organization or in a research center. They develop a mission for their, for their group. Um, working both internally and with stakeholders to make sure that this mission matches what the stakeholders need. 
they discuss institutional funding support for the group and they might get uh, a lot of support from their institution. They might get partial support or they might get no support. They try to create a career path or career paths, including how these paths fit into the formal HR positions that the institution has already. And then the group and its members join the international RSC community, national organizations, local RSC groups, again, as appropriate. They share experiences and they learn from each other. And everyone lives and works happily ever after, at least for a little while, until the group gets to be too big. And then they need to rethink the funding and the structure. And this then leads to lots of confusion and, and lots of turmoil, which hopefully eventually has a happy end. Okay, third version. Somebody hears about RSEs and they realize that in their organization, they either have some or they should. And they may want this to compete with other universities or to recognize the work that's done within the, within the company or within the institution. They formalize a group, either in a department or in an IT organization or in a research center. Um, these stakeholders and then the person that had this idea initially develop a mission for this group. They determine some institutional funding support for the group, probably partial, maybe full, not very likely none in this case. They create career paths for the members of this group, including how they fit into formal HR positions. They hire the leader of the group and group members, or maybe they reorganize existing staff to, to fill this group. And then this group and its members joins the international and national and local RSE groups as before. They can share experiences, learn from each other as before. And as in the previous case, everybody lives and works happily ever after, at least for a little while. But eventually there's the same potential scaling issue as in the previous version, if this is successful. Okay, so that's three different versions of the life cycle of RSEs and, and their communities in different organizations. Any of these three models and combinations of them can occur. There's also other elements that are important. Um, if there is an RSE group, how is it organized? How does it choose and attract projects? How are these projects staffed? How are staff recruited and hired? How are mentoring and career paths and promotion handled? What are the potential roles within the group? Is there a lead? Are there programmers? Is there a scrum master? Is there some other structure? And how does this group fit within its larger institution? Um, in addition, how are RSEs going to be credited in publications or in research outcomes? Are they going to be authors? Are they going to be acknowledged? Is something else going to be done? Are they going to write the papers? And how are these RSEs going to be trained and educated? So he, we looked at three universities and, and their groups um, in a paper last year, uh, University of Manchester, um, NCSA at the University of Illinois, and the Center for Research Computing at the University of Notre Dame. And we found a bunch of different, um, both positive and negative aspects to these groups. And in some cases, these aspects crossed all the groups. And in some cases, they were unique based on the group structure and how it addressed the, the things that were on the previous slide. Um, I'm not going to go into this here because there's not much time, but I do want to point you to these papers, uh, the, the paper and the open access version of the paper, and say that if you're interested, we have done a bit of work, and I am also interested in doing more work and trying to understand how more groups fit in and what the consequences of those different models are. So please contact me if that's something that you're interested in as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan. And uh, now the last uh, video is from uh, the Carpentries. Hello, my name is Jian Kambar, and I am the Lesson Infrastructure Technology Developer at the Carpentries. I'm also an R package developer who's worked in the fields of plant pathology, population genetics, and epidemiology. Research software engineer is a very broad term. It encompasses both researchers who use programming and computational resources to answer their questions and support staff who are creating new ways to remove the barriers for researchers to access computational tools. One commonality that I find among RSEs, however, is that at some point, all of them have had to teach a domain researcher how to use 
either Git, R, or Python, whether enthusiastically or begrudgingly. Another commonality is that RSCs often do not get credit for teaching. The Carpentries is a global volunteer community of practice that focuses on using evidence-based instruction methods to teach researchers core competencies in data analysis and research software. Volunteering with the Carpentries not only gives you training in evidence-based educational practices, but also gets you certified to teach Carpentries lessons anywhere in the world and brings you into a larger community of instructors. Many research software engineers like myself came into their positions from the side of domain science, think biology, chemistry, astronomy, et cetera, and found that writing generalized tools to help other researchers do their work was the best use of their skill set. We like to help people and the Carpentries community helps us help more people around the world. I'm Toby Hodges, a former bioinformatician and bioinformatics community manager, now curriculum community developer at the Carpentries. The Carpentries community is truly global. Our instructors have taught over 2,800 workshops to around 70,000 learners across 67 countries on all seven continents. In 2020, as the pandemic forced many to change the way they work, our community moved their teaching online. In a display of their commitment to feedback and reflective practice, our instructors shared their experiences of running these virtual workshops and collaborated to develop a set of recommendations for organizing and teaching via video conference. So far this year, the Carpentries has taught over 270 online workshops to almost 7,000 learners, but our work is not done yet. We need new instructors and more workshops to increase our reach into new and underserved communities. We've seen how the skills and experience of RSEs can improve the standard of scientific software and research, and we would love to grow our ties with the international research software engineering community to help teach those skills around the world. In addition to the lessons of software data and library carpentry, our community is also actively developing new teaching material on a wide range of topics. Where our core lessons are usually aimed at novices, a lot of the material under development by members of our curriculum community covers more advanced skills relevant to RSEs, such as containerized computing, workflow and environment management systems, and publishing software packages. The curriculum development takes place in the Carpentries Incubator, a dedicated space for the creation of teaching materials using our purpose-built lesson template guided by principles of good lesson design. As the Carpentries curriculum community grows and the maturity and diversity of lessons in the Carpentries incubator increases, we're working to provide new ways to support and promote collaborative development of teaching material. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Njambi Rono. I am Director of Community Engagement and Development here at the Carpentries. Thank you so much for sitting through Toby's and Jian's um, presentation uh, where they shared with you what the Carpentries is, what resources exist in the Carpentries that you can leverage and also ways that you can be involved uh, should you be interested to do that. I'm going to briefly summarize everything that Toby and Jian said and I hope that you will um, be able to join us or reach out to us with any questions you might have. So like Toby and Jian said, the Carpentries is a global organization um, that brings together technologists, researchers, librarians, and scientists for the purpose of um, passing on introductory computational skills and data science skills to these librarians and researchers around the world. Um, the Carpentries is a nonprofit and an umbrella organization that is comprised of three lesson programs software carpentry, data carpentry, and library carpentry. Um, so to date, we have um, we have 85 member organizations in the Carpentries, these are institutions and organizations that pay a fee um, and in return they are able to have Carpentries workshops, um, R and Python workshops run in their organizations. 
um, in these member organizations, uh, 2,918 instructors have been trained to date. Um, and these instructors are people who run workshops, RM Python workshops for the carpentries. To date, they have run over 2,800 workshops and they have reached 71,400 learners. Before March 2020, these learners were primarily um, trained or um, taught in in person workshops. Um, but since COVID happened, some of these numbers are from learners who have sat in online workshops. Uh, we've been to the seven continents and taught workshops in over 61 countries. And on the right, you can see a brief history of the carpentries from where software carpentry was founded, then data carpentry and library carpentry, and how they came together in 2018 under the umbrella of the carpentries and um, everything that has happened to date. This is a core team. We are 13 as of now in hiring. You can check our website for more details. These are the people that um, help the Carpentries um, global community to operate and support them in different ways. Um, and you can reach out to any of them. You can check carpentries.org slash team and see how to reach out any of these people you might have questions for or ideas that you might want to share with. And so as we conclude, we want to welcome you to um, check out our website for more details, um, for ways that you can be involved um, or ways that we need you <laughs> and your skills in the carpentries or um, just to find answers to some of the outstanding questions you might have. You can also follow us on Twitter at the carpentries. You can also check our GitHub repository where uh, all our lessons are and you can contribute to them, you can go through them in a self-paced way, and we look forward to seeing you around. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so th thanks also to the uh, Carpentries team for their uh, talk. Uh, and I think now, Anadena, over to you. Yes, I found the unmute button. <laughs> so now we're going to get the participants here in the session, so all of you a bit active, to discuss further about what we want to know about RSE and why. I mean, hopefully this video gave you a bit of inspiration and set the scene about what kind of questions we're talking about. Yeah, so it's very basic numbers about like uh, how many RSEs are there actually, but also how do communities work, what kind of a do to provide communities it touches on policies and it certainly also touches a bit on concrete uh, topics around like characteristics of research software and research software development processes so the idea is that we're going to the discussion using this world cafe format um, some of you might know that from pre-corona times in a uh, in the physical world so the way it works there usually is that you put put up different flip charts across a room or different tables where people can gather all of these places would have a specific topic or question, and then a group of people, so people would distribute to these places, discuss the topic for, for a certain time, let's say 20 minutes, and then they would move on to the next topic and then continue based on the notes that the previous group has left there, they would continue the discussion. And this is also the idea that we want to, to have here. To make it technically a bit easier, we will change the detail a bit. Namely, we will stay in the breakout rooms and rather have the topics rotating rather than having people rotate through, through breakout groups, which seem to be a bit difficult to us. So what we will do is that we um, ask Terry, uh, ask Marion, sorry, to put us into uh, three breakout groups where Carlos, um, me, and actually the plan was to have Michelle as one of the moderators, uh, there and the rest of you just randomly assigned. It doesn't matter really because topics will rotate and so you will get to discuss all of the topics anyway. Um, and these three topics will be, so we divided it roughly into people, infrastructure and policy, where people means everything that has to do with the RSEs as, as, yeah, as people, what they do, their skills, where do they come from, uh, what are their job profiles, what do they need to know, um, yeah, everything that you can boil down to, to questions about people. Uh, the second topic will be infrastructure. So both meaning 
the infrastructure that RSEs need to, to work in terms of what, yeah, what, how they need to be equipped and the, what's, um, yeah, what institutions, organizations need to be in place for them. Um, but also research software itself as a main piece of scientific infrastructure today. So what is the meaning uh, about that? Yeah, and policy, last but not least, is about bringing that all to higher levels to the awareness of funders, of organizations, of those who make the, the big plans and how would you influence that? So in the, we have working documents for you and there is, again, a bit of information about these three, three topics. Um, so there's, this is shared Google Docs. Everyone can enter questions and everything, um, and everything motivations and links to, to literature there. But we would still suggest that every, all of the sessions appoint like a dedicated note taker who really takes care that everything that is discussed is captured. Because in our idea, we would also not just like everyone goes hacking into the documents, but also hopefully you will discuss a bit of what you put in there and what relevant question would be. Um, in this session, it's not about like ranking or if, um, if people, which questions are more important than others. Here's, here's really like a collection of things. What would you want to know about these topics? But important for us is to also note down why. Uh, you could all ask all sorts of things, for example, like the average shoe size of research software engineers in the UK, but for what would that be useful? On the other hand, if you ask questions like how many are there, there's a lot of motivations for asking them, of course. So please record also the motivation of why the answers to the question would be interesting. Um, and in case you know of research that is, exists already and that addresses the, these questions or in part, also please add a link to, um, to, the, to the document, to the table. We do expect, however, that to many questions there will be no literature yet. But, yeah, but we would be happy to be positively surprised in, in the other case. Yeah, so that would be the plan. So before I ask Marion really to put us into, into groups, question is if there are any questions on, on this or if you think that is, that is more or less clear what we want. I think we will do this for roughly an, an hour and I would ping the moderators after um, there are 20 minutes to move to the next topic and then also put the link to um, the, the other documents so that you can continue. Do, do we maybe, so uh, I think Michelle, has she arrived? I don't think so, no? I'm afraid not. No, okay. Then do we have maybe someone who would like to volunteer for like being a bit of a moderator of the session? or one of the breakout groups. It's not terribly difficult. It's just, especially someone who needs to keep an eye on the chat and also um, maybe see when I send the message, now is time to move on to the next topic. And other than that, just moderating the discussion a bit. No special knowledge needed for that. So please, someone. Or do we need to pick someone? <laughs> From previous experience, I know Stefan is a great, great moderator. Okay. So Stefan? I think, I think Neil has just said he could moderate just now, but oh, needs yeah, to man. pop out later. So I could do some moderation later on, but I have to, I have to run for 10 minutes now and come back in 10 minutes. So I don't think for this session I'd be... Uh, very useful. Moderator. Okay, we might we might ask you later. <laughs> yeah, sure. And maybe we start off with what Neil. What means now, or when do you need to pop out? Um, it's about. Uh, oh, I'm trying to work out in about an hour and fifteen minutes, I think. Oh, that's fine. I mean, we'll run this session for not more than an hour, uh, so that would be perfect. And then we do a break, and then we discuss about the second one. I might ask Stefan again. So, okay, maybe then Neil is one of our moderators. And as I said, so it doesn't matter, topics will rotate anyway, and you will just uh, yeah, get to discuss all three topics. Okay, then maybe Marion, can you put us in breakout groups like this? Yes, I'll so do. So Neil, Carlos and me, and then the other people just randomly uh, and and see what happens. I'll share the link to the landing page document. 
Yes, yeah, we forgot that. So there's a main document with links to everything and we'll, I will send to you and to Neil like the document that you're going to start with in your session, okay? So that we rotate and not work on the same document at the same time. Okay, then I'll open the rooms now. Okay, is everybody back? Or are we still waiting for some people? then it's almost time for a break we just would have one quick mentimeter question for all you guys before we before we go into the break and that is i will show you if i manage to share my screen again uh, this one here We just would like to know among the question you have been collecting and discuss which one is your kind of your personal favorite and that could be like the most important one the most funny one uh, the most absurd one uh, whatever you might think of so if all the questions you have seen before what what do you think is the best you've seen and after the break we're going to work on a bit more serious prioritization of all, of the things Yeah, so when RSEs quit, where do they go? And that's certainly, I agree, it's an interesting one. Um, maybe not so nice to ask, but can you see it going? Visibility, yeah. Why do people become RSEs? What are the motivations? Yes. So that seems to be a really favorite question. <laughs> Reinventing the wheel. Yes, that's a that's a good one as well. Including the not developed home, not developed here syndrome. But I see, I mean, yeah, I can see even about computer science colleagues, that's very exposed characteristic. It's not only RSEs. Okay, while we maybe just, just watch two or, three, two or more, three more uh, questions coming in, I would just say, let's start taking a break. We promised 30 minutes, I think we should do that. And then we have officially then some, some 45 minutes left after, uh, after that break, where we would do one other breakout session uh, for discussing the questions again and prioritizing a bit, but that should not take us more than like 15, 20 minutes um, again, so we won't do the rotating, just one group and uh, it, three groups, each of the groups will focus on one of the topics and we will do that. And then we can spend the rest of the time discussing the, the paper writing process a bit before we close. So that's the plan. But first I would say we go for a 30 minutes well-deserved break and have a coffee and see you back in yeah, roughly 30 minutes. Quarter past, I would say. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you had some sustenance or a, a few minutes to uh, refresh and uh, get ready to keep going just till the end of this hour. Uh, so what we have to do for the, the, the remaining time, uh, first we're going to split into breakout groups again. Uh, so three breakout groups again using the uh, breakout um, topics that we had last time of policy, people and infrastructure, but you'll be randomly assigned to one of those groups uh, this time. Now, if you end up in a group that you're unhappy with, you can simply exit the breakout room and you'll go back to our host who can put you uh, in a different group if you particularly wanted to be in one of those three people, policy or infrastructure. Uh, and we'd ask you to go back to the same Google documents that you had before um, for that applied to each of those uh, areas, people, policy and infrastructure and look through the many interesting suggestions that we've all contributed over the last couple of hours and try and prioritize according to these three questions. Uh, what are the three most important questions, uh, the three most urgent ones and the three lowest hanging fruit? Uh, so some different ways uh, to prioritize and to give some indication of why. Uh, we've cut back the time a little bit 
Uh, if you could go into those groups for 15 minutes and then come and do a very quick uh, report back, uh, then that would be fantastic. Then after that, we'll have a quick discussion about how we might progress writing a paper based on all of this work, uh, and then just a summation at this end. Uh, Anna Elena, is there anything I've forgotten there? Uh, no, it's good. Maybe just to, to clarify that this one, we will not rotate topics, but it, each of the groups will just pick one. Um, if it's like you, me, and Carlos again, and one of them, uh, everyone picks picks one, um, and then we're good to go. So we don't have to rotate this time. So therefore, also 15 minutes should be enough. All right. Okay. So we'll go to those groups now, and you'll be randomly assigned, as I said. Uh, but if you're unhappy, you can exit it and ask to be put into a different one. So I think we'll just wait now for our host to activate that for us. See you in those groups. All right, so we we'll, might go around uh, and do the report backs now. So the first group uh, was uh, topic one, people. Who was the reporting on for that? Uh, yeah, so I was um, in the topic one, people. Uh, yeah, so I think the most important, more, most uh, interesting thing is that a lot of the questions uh, clustered around uh, HR. Uh, uh, yeah, around recruiting and around training of RSCs. Uh, so some of them that there was overlap between the questions. So we we picked the ones that we thought are more important and more urgent based on the. Um, I think the most important ones are in terms of training for the future of RSCs, and the most urgent ones are are is where we focus more on the. How do we, fix, do we fix the problems that we have today in recruiting RSC to make sure that we can uh, um, yeah, continue running that these are the problems that we face day to day that we don't have enough uh, capacity. Uh, the low hanging fruit, it's mostly questions that are very interesting to answer and that are not very uh, that basically this could be part of an R of the RSC survey and it, we would find interesting answers uh, and that it's I think it's, they're mostly very um, interesting to know to understand better the RSC community and to understand better what are the uh, challenges where people are coming from and to for a sense of identity almost um, did, did I miss anything the, from what we discussed quickly? Um, yeah, so I think. All right. Are, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Carlos, and, and your group. Uh, Anna Lena, who's reporting for you? Uh, we haven't talked about that, so I can just quickly do it. <laughs> we were not as productive as you and not so structured, as you can see. Um, but we kind of realized that a lot of like, questions that were collected actually point in a similar direction uh, of things and uh, try to cluster them a bit anew and rearrange uh, them uh, along those lines. And for example, one of the two very important questions that to answer that we find were this constantly, why do people reinvent the wheel? This idea came back in a, several of the concrete questions actually. Uh, and that is, yeah, for, for sustainability and also for for convincing people to to fund um, yeah research software development for longer amounts of time that's definitely crucial and that go, again goes in line with the second urge is like what amount of funding is actually available yeah and and also what amount of funding is available for new software as opposed to maintaining software that already exists so that's maybe also part of the same problem. Uh, because I mean, if, if funders only give money for new software, then of course the old one will not be sustained and wheels will be reinvented just because of that. And uh, um, as we think that a better understanding of, of these mechanisms should, what actually happens would be very valuable. Um, yeah, for the most urgent, um, that goes into a very technical direction. So licenses, like what is open source and closed, but also if it's open source, which licenses are being adopted. Um, that's important also to understand was and also urgent and also a very urgent thing that we said was yeah, binding constraints that just technical constraints that RSEs account, encounter most often. 
in terms of like, uh, do they lack computing or storage facilities? Do they lack expertise? Um, these kind of things, what really keeps them from doing the work properly? Um, and low and hanging fruits, yeah, we could not really agree on, on something, what we're thinking in terms of a bit of like methodology to do that. And this does not only apply to infrastructure, but also to the other ones. So basically, we said that everything that we can just ask in the surveys to the RSEs that we can connect to through our existing channels, like source and the Slack and national mailing list and so on, that is probably like conceptually the easiest to do because it it's needs a well-designed survey, but then we know how to do it as opposed to asking questions to outsiders it's much more difficult how to reach them for example yeah so this needs to be worked out a bit further thanks Anna Elena and for our group on policy uh, Robert's going to uh, give the um, feedback yep hello um, yeah so for the most important questions, we mostly focused on things that would help change policy in the future. Uh, so the main one we had was figuring out how to get work done by RICs to be recognized um, both internally and externally by like your own facility staff and by external funding organizations. That's very important to getting uh, changes in policy made. The other pretty important question we had was how groups that already exist get their funding since knowing that will help others start up their own groups and would also kind of help us figure out how this has been done in the past. And then the third most important question we had was how crucial existing groups have been in uh, research projects that have been done already, since knowing this and having something on paper would help with making policy changes in the future. For the most urgent ones, we cheated a bit and put the first two from mo most important down. Uh, since they're also probably the most urgent. And then most urgent, we also had typical job descriptions for RSEs, since it's kind of along the same theme, but like knowing what is classified as an RSE job, effectively classified as an RSE job would help to say, hey, look, you already employ these people as research software engineers, you're just not saying it. And that would also help a lot with policy changes. And for lowest hanging fruit, they're not necessarily easy to answer, but they're the ones that are at least more concrete. So it's mostly things where you could just write down the answer on a paper if you can find the answer. Um, so it's stuff like looking at universities and seeing how they do their software licensing, figuring out how many RSC groups there are in each country, which define themselves as RSC groups. And then the last one is um, looking at uh, like internally changing the definition of, of like software engineer to research software engineer and then pushing for these positions to be more long term uh, since RSEs would be able to support things in like the long run, at least ideally. Uh, so yeah, those were the three uh, assignment answers. <laughs> Thanks, Robert, and thanks to Stefan's comments in, in the chat about the urgent ones in policy aligning nicely with those in, in people. I think that's uh, really interesting to see those synergies emerging quite naturally. Uh, so I, th I think this has been a fantastically useful exercise for me and I hope for all of you in, in identifying a range of issues and then almost beginning some of the clustering. I think the conversations I heard and particularly as we thought about prioritization uh, got us beginning to distinguish between types of questions that were similar or questions that were meta questions and, and some of the smaller uh, discrete projects uh, that were exemplified in, in uh, different questions below them. Uh, so what we'd really like to do as a uh, next step in, in this work, uh, first of all, we're repeating this workshop in a couple of days for a slightly different time zone and we'll get some more input. Uh, but then we'd like to write this up in, into a paper, uh, which would begin to chart out what we need in, in RSE research. And there's potentially something then that we can show to funders or our own organizations help their own chart, their own uh, research agendas, uh, think about how we address some of these crucial questions. Uh, so we'd like to do some kind of review of the questions, the types of questions that have emerged and perhaps be able to show that uh, there might be a few pieces of research towards some of these, but substantively uh, they're not done. Uh, and we've been thinking about a timeline towards producing this, uh, which uh, 
has us working together over the next few months. Uh, there's a timeline up there on the shared screen for you to have a look at. Uh, and so in, in, in a few minutes, we'll uh, ask if people would like to be interested in uh, being involved and you could put your name down on the Google Doc. But first, let me just open the floor generally. Do people have any uh, comments on, on this idea? Do you think it's worthwhile? Have you had any thoughts as we've been going through the last couple of hours on what sections could look like or what you'd really like to see included in it? Anyone want to add anything at this point? Simon has a right hand. Oh, yes, Simon, sorry. Just cut in the end and start talking. That's, <laughs> that's sorry. Um, but uh, I have to say that I'm really agreeing with a number of the points that are all reported back there. And I think that there's an interesting mix of um, things that you're asking for, like some stuff like job descriptions and things. They already exist in, at least in the UK, they do. So we could easily share those. Um, and it'd be very easy to, it was very easy to get people to share their job descriptions. Uh, it just needed somewhere for them to put them. So we set up a, a GitHub repo. Um, and then some of the broader questions about, you know, maintenance funding for software over this sort of fetishization of novelty that research councils have is like, uh, it's going to be a long battle to fight. We've been fighting it for 10 years in the UK and we are making some headway, but we're yet to have a big success on the, on the funding for maintenance. And then coming to some of the other things, like I really like the idea of this asking the RSCs about, you know, what's the low hanging fruit for you and what do you think would actually change um, you know, uh, your, the level of recognition you're getting. So I also, you know, mundane changes lead to, to big successes quite often. Um, so we're putting the RSC, the international RSC survey together now. Um, so we could ask a question certainly on that and try and collect some information and feed that back. Obviously that we won't have the data until start next year, but, but I'm um, happy to, it'll be all be shared openly. So if there's anything else to go into the international survey, then, then let me know. But that will be yeah, fantastic. A, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it would also be fantastic if we can identify where some data sources exist to answer these questions uh, to enhance the, uh, you know, um, pitch that it it's, would be quite easy for someone to answer this question because some of the data has been uh, um, created. Uh, so, for example, the Australians have a database of about 200 job descriptions, I think, uh, that they uh, um, simulated a year or two ago. Any other general comments or, or thoughts on uh, what the paper might look like? Is there any particular venue you're, you're thinking about where to submit this? Yeah, that's actually our next question. <laughs> we've, we've got a, a Mentimeter slide. And Elena, if you want to go on, but it's not a Mentimeter slide. Uh, it's just a question. Oh, it is a Mentimeter slide. Um, yes, yeah, certainly topical, um, and we'd really like people's input, uh, even at this early stage, on where we might be aiming for, because that can help shape uh, how the paper evolves. Uh, so if people have any thoughts on journals or other places, other types of uh, publication avenues, then please put that in the Mentimeter or in the chat, if you like. Yeah, we just felt like Mentimeter allows you to do it anonymously, so if you prefer that. <laughs> In the meantime, a question to Simon Hetrick. Uh, when's the RSC survey going out? What would be the deadline if we wanted to get questions into it? End of Joss? Year. It'll be it'll be going out at the end of the year. So okay. Uh, so basically in December. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll won't do this quietly. I'll do it. I'll do it loud. I'll do it, I will do it in association with the National Association, so they'll be able to get the news out too. Right. Yeah, well, we could probably, I mean, we, we don't have a deadline yet, is it? unless we decide for, to go for a specific deadline. And if it makes sense to delay it a bit and wait for the results of that survey, we can do it. Right. Yeah, so I mean, we have some, so do, but JAWS is really about software, right? Like a, for publishing software, so I don't know if that would fit. Doesn't it have another paper type? Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, more like a policy piece or something or other. I think I think there is another type of paper. But yes, we would need to check that. Yeah. Otherwise, Joris is a obvious candidate, of course. <laughs> F one thousand as well.
right. Well, I'm sure that discussion will continue as we uh, get into the writing and uh, think about where we want it to end up. So the next question is who would like to be actively uh, involved in this? So in the main Google document, I'll put it back in the chat for you. At the bottom, I've just put a heading there called who would like to be involved in this uh, and possible roles. So if you are interested, then please feel free to add your details there. And if there's, if you particularly like to be heavily involved in creating from the inception or you'd prefer uh, more to be involved in reviewing later drafts uh, or, or whatever, um, then you can indicate any of that. And we'll certainly ask that question more broadly of the community, not only um, necessarily of people in this session, we have the repeat session as well. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, so any... could people also put it on, on top in the list, would they have their names anyway? Oh yeah, I, I guess that would, what would you do? that is fine. Oh. I think it's important is just that you have your, your name and contact data listed here so that we can contact you for following up. And I think Simon had a second question. Yeah, Simon. So I have to say that so I, I'm, I'm a non-publishing academic, right? I'm <laughs> value of papers definitely for reporting back on, on scientific discoveries, research discoveries. But for some of these things, I sometimes find that the stipulations put on you by the journals uh, mean that you can't sort of release the thing you want to release. And, and for this, and often it's more like a report than a, than mm -hmm. a publication. And again, the, the requirement for novelty and stuff can make you write a slightly odd document. So I, I, and I'm not saying that this is the way we should definitely go, but but uh, no, is there some idea, is there some credence possibly in like writing this as a report that would be published or you know, doing it through like a, a more open platform like trying to get something into nature or, or something along those lines? Is there, are there other routes that aren't just publication based and journal publication based for releasing this document? Or am I just too hard line against publications? No, I mean, I, th I guess we call the paper just because it's a general term, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be like a research outlet. I mean, the, the question, this is also why we ask the question is like, what outlet makes sense for this? I mean, we, we don't write this piece of like for you know, getting, getting scientific credit in that sense. So anything else could also be fine, but it's with where it's visible and but where also people hopefully, if you talk to policymakers, where they take it serious as a source. And it could, if it's a journal, it's okay, but it doesn't have to be. Let's put it like that. In my experience, if 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 a report has enough uh, eyes on it, it starts to get its own credibility on the on the back of that, and then certainly. If you can get it out or associated with some of the sort of the main publishers, then that helps as well. Um, and the other thing, just the the logos on the front of it, you know, help uh, policymakers take it seriously. So I see things like so the Stack Overflow you know, developer survey that's released each year has really it's got a lot of impact because um, people believe it, you know, uh, and it's not released as a, as a publication. So there might be something um, about writing this up as a report. For one thing, you then you control the publication schedule. It's not up to the whims of a, of a publisher. Yeah, I think that's a good point that you can still get a lot of credibility for the work uh, because of the authorship or, or the community supporting it. And it doesn't have to be the, yes, the impact journal factor. <laughs> now obsolete. <laughs> All right, well, let's bring us towards the end of the workshop. Uh, we'd really like to take this opportunity to say thank you uh, to all of you for coming and for contributing so actively uh, for such a long period. Uh, we realize it's quite a long session and uh, we're so glad so many of you are still here and I certainly found our group conversations uh, very useful and I hope that others did too. Certainly the, the summaries of the prioritization uh, results coming out it looked like it was an incredibly useful exercise in getting us to think um, not only about our own interests but hearing about other people's priorities. Uh, any other words um, to wrap up from anyone else? If we can make it, does it make sense for us to join the second run of this workshop as well? 
You're very welcome to, and you know, certainly would be a different grouping with some different brainstorming, but using exactly the same process as we've mm -hmm. used today. Thank you. So certainly if you found it a good networking opportunity or to share ideas, and we certainly had that as part of the aim of this, uh, was to, as always, develop our community, then um, you're very welcome to join again. Anything else from anyone else? All right, then we will be in touch about the paper writing process, as the slide says. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to get together a community to think about this meta issue, but which is comprised of so many small issues that are near and dear to so many of us, and to think about how we uh, can advance uh, those issues that we all hold so dear um, about research software engineering. So thank you again for your time. I look forward to catching up with you in some other forum at some point. Uh, there's other source workshops going on uh, about every week. Uh, ho our host, did you want to say anything about upcoming source? Yes. Um, if I could share my screen. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is just uh, the next few um, sessions that come up. So we have talked about um, next Friday. Um, next week, we will have a um, talk about configuring swings from scratch. And you can always go to our website uh, to find out uh, what else is coming because uh, we still have an ongoing rolling call, as I mentioned before. And um, we will be adding um, new, um, new events um, to our uh, schedule. So that's everything from me. So thank you to our organizers. So I think this was a great first workshop for Source. Uh, thank you very much for to Michelle, Annalena, and Carlos. And yeah, so hopefully here of uh, see that paper very soon. And thank you very much to Source. We really appreciate this opportunity to uh, run this within your uh, environment and, and access that community. And uh, thank you. We'll see you all again sometime soon. We will. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for and being especially here. Especially Marion, also for technical support. Went very well. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. So we briefly summarize what we discussed. I can share the screen and uh, let the document show. So maybe people yeah. want to say something. If we find the right buttons, that is here. So this is the people group. Yeah, so uh, so we kind of cheated a little bit um, uh, because we thought that there were different questions that were kind of similar to each other. So we ended up with, um, in some cases, up to five questions out of three. Um, but they're really kind of the same question. So there really are kind of three topics in each case. Um, and the last one, the low hanging fruit, we did the least work on and we're kind of rushed on. So that probably, I would say, we have the least faith in. Um, but, but basically, it seemed like the, the questions um, that we thought were the important ones were the ones that were really related to RC career tracks in some sense and um, and how people come in, what what skills they have, what background they have, what how, how we define RSEs in some way is kind of one of them. Um, what happens like when you're an RSE? How do you or how do you branch potentially? Do you are there other things that you can do besides just become a manager or stay at the same level forever? Um, and then are there disadvantages to being labeled an RSC, which in some sense is really a question about, um, are there things that are causing people to leave the RSC field that we should be thinking about? Um, so we were thinking about those as the important questions in terms of the urgent questions. Um, it, it's actually kind of similar in some ways. It's, it's again, um, right, what are these, what do these positions mean? Um, if we have RSE positions and we have other positions of people that are doing kind of RSE work, how do we distinguish between them, um, right? How do we put people into the right career path so that they are being measured on the thing that's really right for them? Um, how do we prevent waste of resources from people moving on to other projects so that the right, work software might become unmaintainable or unusable? And, and that's kind of tied to what long-term perspective makes an RSE career path 
attractive. Again, kind of how do we how do we keep RSEs and how do we keep the work they've done? Um, and then uh, again, kind of the, those things coming in. And for low hanging fruit, uh, again, we were thinking about kind of what are these things coming in? Um, here, maybe a little bit more because we feel like we just need to define RSEs a little bit better than, it, than has been done. Uh, what are the requirements to be an RSE? Um, like, do you need a PhD? Do you not need a PhD? How do we, again, this is kind of defining RSEs. And, um, and then last, uh, how, do we, how do we support RSEs that are doing kind of open source work that maybe isn't, isn't tied directly to a funded project, but are kind of contributing to the community in some sense, because it seems like that should be part of what RSEs are doing as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll just ask the next group to quickly summarize infrastructure. Um, yeah, so for infrastructure, uh, some of the important questions, uh, what proportion of funding should be dedicated to infrastructure and how long should we uh, support uh, infrastructure? There's an underlying uh, theme here that um, it boils down to uh, the amount of money that is available to to the infrastructure. So uh, where is the funding coming from? Uh, if we had infinite funding, this wouldn't be an issue. But of course, uh, funding is never infinite. So this is this is there's like an underlying topic of uh, it boils down to money. Um, and there's also a question about who controls the infrastructure. So if we're using uh, our public cloud, Amazon cloud, or uh, our own national or uh, institutional supercomputer. Uh, what's the what's the split there? Uh, in terms of urgent questions, uh, we thought about how do we identify and preserve research software in a way that can be rerun and reused many years from now. So uh, sustainability aspect in mind. Uh, what type of infrastructure is missing for the RSC? Uh, and what do we ensure, uh, how do we ensure sufficient funding for RSC work, which again comes back to this underlying topic of, um, of the money available to, to RSCs. Um, in terms of the low hanging fruit, we thought that uh, how do researchers search for a software? So there was a uh, this ties to a previous question on, on the infrastructure that is, that is available for publishing a software. And once the software is published, how do we search for it? Uh, and how do researchers search for it so it gets found? Uh, which I think it's, it's, uh, would be um, an interesting question to answer. Uh, how, can, how easily can you get data from different, in different disciplines? So, it is very different in the humanities and in um, astronomy, uh, which is also probably uh, easy to answer with a survey. Uh, and what is the infrastructure that uh, RSC groups need uh, to help them keep track of projects and to choose uh, new work, to assign RSCs to work? So that's also uh, something that it might be a low hanging fruit. It might be something quite um, easy to find through a survey to find find out how different RSE groups are organizing their work. Uh, yeah, so the, that was our team. I don't know if anybody from our team wants to uh, add anything that I missed. And if not, let's go to the next team. Yeah, so we have Jeremy here, volunteer to report. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, so we didn't quite complete all of the questions, but I think we, we spent quite a lot of time thinking about um, the kind of the importance of like underpinning policy. And the most important questions were really about how we um, sell the value of RSE to an institution and how we, on the other side, ensure that people who are potential RSEs understand the, the benefits and the value of being RSEs. So on the, on the kind of the institutional side, um, I think we, we felt that really the main underpinning of, of policy was this this sort of strong understanding from an institutional perspective about what RSE and what is and what the value of RSE is um, and what contribution RSEs provide to research. So in other words, in supporting the kind of quality of research outputs of an institution and ensuring that that um, the policies that the institution develops um, support 
the the potential that RSEs offer. So um, that was the, the sort of institutional aspect. We also highlighted the the funders and um, the kind of being able to convince funders and agencies of the the added value that RSEs provide, and ensuring that they can actually support RSEs, but also support institutions in providing the kind of infrastructure for RSEs through the the, the way that they manage their calls and so on. Um, in ter in terms of highlighting the importance of, of sort of RSE career um, to potential RSEs, uh, we, we felt it was important to, to, to highlight kind of the, the various aspects of, of what RSEs do and why they are kind of key the, in the modern um, research space to ensuring high quality outputs because as things become more computationally advanced, we need more software, we need more people that have the detailed understanding of software and people that can uh, you know, can develop these high quality applications that will support research. So um, again, I think, you know, RSEs themselves or people who are potential RSEs have a lot of opportunity to uh, contribute to policy, I think, in that in that area as well. Um, the other thing that we felt was really important was how we kind of support metrics, um, uh, the use of metrics to ensure that we understand the value um, of RSEs and the, the the kind of merit that they they provide. So, um, particularly in the context of of the DORA and the, the Declaration of Research Assessment, sort of ensuring that um, you know now there are um, at least in theory uh, approaches that will support giving people um, kind of or evaluating people differently based on what they do, not just based on the number of citations they get and um, the quality of where they publish and so on. We felt that that actually offered op opportunities to RSEs and we feel that's a really important one as well. Um, in terms of the most urgent and, and kind of lowest hanging fruits, we, we highlighted in terms of most urgent, the sources of funding that are available and really being able to um, clearly provide those different funding sources uh, to, to, to people who are potentially looking for them and to the institutions themselves to show that there's value in, in, in RSE work. And also, we, I think we thought that in terms of the lowest hanging fruits, the value, really being able to state the value of RSEs to an institution, which we also highlighted in, in the most important, um, is something which we can do probably fairly straightforwardly, because I think most of us can probably make a pretty good argument for why we think RSE is important and why we think that institutions should feel this is important. So that was kind of where we got to. And the, there was a long list of questions in the document there. And I think there's probably various other things that we could use to fill out the, the, the most urgent and lowest hanging fruits. And I don't know if, if um, Anna Lena or if any of the other people want to want to comment on anything there that I've missed. But, uh... I think there was a good summary. Yes. Maybe I'll just take it from, from here. Thanks for your summary as well and for that and then Carlos. Um, it, we only have a very few minutes left. So I'm just telling you the most important bits of what is now following from this. Uh, so really don't worry if you have not finished this exercise to or this assignment to your own um, satisfaction, because this is really only um, a start of the discussion with this workshop. And we are very happy to see that it was so lively and we already collected a lot of input. Um, but as Carlos was explaining in the beginning, so our goal is actually to write a kind of like, say, review paper, research agenda, report, article, whatever you want to call it, as uh, substantiation of the need for, for more RSE research needed in all these directions that we sketched sketch today. Um, so may, maybe as a small one, make sure that your name and contact data is on this list in this document here, because we will use that to follow up with you uh, on everything about the paper writing process in, in the following. And our idea is a bit that, so we three organizers, so Michelle, Carlos and me, will get together someone next week or so look at everything that we collected during the workshops and see a bit, okay, what, what do we have there? How do we go from there? And we will also try to tidy it up a bit, to clean it up a bit, um, to put it in a bit consistent structure. And then we would, as first phase, until the end of the month probably, ask you for, for input again for uh, more literature. So whatever more articles there be, be that you could name that we could coll just collect that and try to make sure that we don't miss too much that is actually out there but our expectation really is it's a it's a young field so there's not too much research and especially empirical research being yet done so far um so next milestone would be a bit to to sort that and we would take it in our hands to maybe 
turn these things into to first drafts that we will give then to everybody to comment and revise. And the ambitious plan maybe then is to, yeah, to have something ready for submission by the end of January. So maybe that's a bit too optimistic. And we discussed also last time that it's time for the next big RSE survey in the beginning of the year. And maybe we should wait for first results from that one anyway and buy that together. But we will, we will see that. Um, so that's roughly the plan, but uh, in, in especially this is this was a start. This was really a starting point. We will tidy up a bit and then be in touch with you all on organizing the further writing. And then we will also see if there are specific people who really volunteer writing, who want to contribute maybe text about a specific part. Uh, just let us know, but we will explicitly ask for that again in with our emails too. I think for the moment, for the next two weeks, we need a bit of time to, to really review everything and make a bit of a plan. Um, so if there are questions at this point, maybe just feel free to unmute and comment. The other questions I would like, like to give to you because this is not decided yet. What do you think would be a good outlet for this kind of paper report article um, where it then reaches the right, is available and reaches the right right people. So if you have any ideas of this, feel, please feel free to, to unmute and suggest or also to, to message us later. It has not been decided yet. And I'm having a look at the chat. I think there's something. Maybe JOR, so this journal of open research journal of research software would definitely be a good good fit, I think. Other people I think have suggested F1000 because it's also where this big position paper is exactly from, uh, from Germany has been, has been published. IEEE software, I'm not too familiar with how that magazine works, but could also be an option. Yeah, so Jeremy, um, I think, sorry, if I'm thinking of the right paper, um, there's a paper that Jeremy led that I was on that we just put into IEEE software that worked fairly well, I believe, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so they were, I mean, they're, it's more of a overall software engineering community and not specifically RSCs, but they were certainly interested in learning about RSCs as long as we kind of cast it overall. I think I, I would just say the one issue that I have with F1000 is that they'll, I mean, they'll certainly accept it, they'll review it, yeah. but it doesn't have any built-in audience. And so then we have to do the audience work, whereas with some of these other things, there might be somewhat of a built-in audience, particularly IEEE software. Right. Yeah. I was also thinking maybe it could also be good to have like a short and a long version in two different venues. So then differentiate that a bit, but I mean, we should start with something in mind, yeah. But F1000 is, is also an option, yeah. I, I agree with Dan just to say, sorry. No, I, I was just, I was just going to say to uh, Alexander that uh, F1000 and uh, JORS would be um, open, open access yeah. With Jordan costing 400 pounds, I think. And if uh, I interpolate software to be open access for, I think, $1,800. So, uh, like $3,000, I think, for software. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but, but it should definitely be open access. I think otherwise, we're just like <laughs> not giving a good example. Yeah. Sorry, Jeremy, though, you were going to say something different. No, all I was going to say was I think, I think your, your suggestion. Plan of IEEE software is great. The only thing I would highlight there that we we discovered, I think, when we uh, were going through the process, was that IEEE software. My understanding is they focus more on the kind of prof professional software practitioner community as their kind of main output. Mm -hmm. And I think you know there's a great opportunity here to pitch the importance of RSC to that community, but also we probably want to be pitching this inward as well to our own community. And I don't know how much that affects whether IEEE software is an option and whether also we should be looking at other potentially at more kind of research focused IEEE journals that we're interested in in review papers um, where they're kind of more you know willing to accept review type type material uh, I don't know it's just a suggestion I mean and we also I mean we don't decide at this point it's really just collecting suggestions we also have a couple of things from Wednesday but there's an overlap already of course eScience conference is another candidate yeah Okay, but this is all noted. I'm gonna just like looking at the time, I would think we move towards closing the session. So as I said, uh, we will be in touch about the paper writing process. Um, we enjoyed all the discussion with you. 
on these two days, or especially also with you guys here today. I hope you did as well. Um, and yeah, be aware that there's still much work to do for us <laughs> if we want to follow up on, on, on all of this. Does anyone make to make some more comments? Any more questions? So before we do any more questions, I just want to say a big thank you to right. Annalena and Carlos and of course, Michelle, who's in Australia um, for organizing this. So I think big round of applause. Maybe. And thank, <laughs> thanks to, to you a lot for technical support. This has really been smooth. So this was good, good to have. Thank you. I just have one quick question. Um, yes. So actually we were doing, we were kind of gathering questions today, weren't we? I, since we were having this talk, I've already thought of another one in my mind, and I was like, "Oh, that would have been a good question." Have we got? Are we able to kind of um, add thoughts to some sort of document if we have have those, you know, too late for the, these discussions? Yeah, sure. I mean, now for the moment, just the documents are open. Feel free to to add them there. Probably at some point when revising them, we will close them for comments, just not to miss anything. But for the for the time being, they're just open. So feel free to add anything that comes to your mind. Not sure that's perfect. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, then just thank you again. I mean, in Europe, we're really like now entering our weekend. For those who were it's still Friday morning, I wish you a yeah, productive last day, working day of the week. And yeah, we'll be in touch soon.